Uh, the Ambassador of Hungary has uh, chosen to join us today. And um, I said to her, and she sort of looked at me, I said, I was first in Hungary in 1973. Now, the older I get when I say that to audiences and they try to equate, when was 1973? You know, uh, the world began in the 21st century for some. Uh, the, uh, as I come to your events, and I'm very honored by the invitation, uh, truly you have mental flashbacks of different places that you've been and, and what you've seen. And one particularly vivid memory for me was my first trip across Europe in a tiny little car, leaving Paris, driving east. And uh, the objective was to drive into the former Soviet Union, which we ultimately did. But I will never forget the first memorable border crossing. Uh, I was 27 years old, and we were, uh, our mother and I were in Heidelberg, Germany, actually. We'd reached Heidelberg, and we were headed toward the border crossing at what was then Czechoslovakia, headed toward Prague. And here I am, a young American, you know, you think you can do everything right. Life has been good in many ways. You got your college education, you got a job, you could finally afford to pay for your mom to go on a trip to Europe. and. Uh, to see a part of the world open up and to go try to find the remnants of your family, if you could. And when you got to that border, and it had been nice, we'd been in France, in little pensions, you know, and uh, then moving into Germany and the beautiful mountains, and, and then all of a sudden you got to that border and you looked out at an expanse about as long as from this side of the room to the other, and it was stark. And there were gun turrets and barbed wire on both sides, and you had to make a decision whether you believed that your American passport and your visa would ever let you come out of the world you were about to enter. And I can remember we looked at one another, And we saw the guards with bayonets walking across that no man's land as we moved from the free world to the unfree world. And it remains just so strong in my mind. And we made the decision to drive through. We were the only car. And we were held for a long time at that border. And as we ultimately were allowed to drive into then Czechoslovakia, headed toward Prague, we were the only vehicle on the road that was not military. And I can remember a military truck in front of us. First of all, here we were, two women in a little orange car, rental car. And um, these soldiers kept picking up the tarp on the back of the truck, the ones that were sitting, you know, in the back of the truck, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Uh, that was long before I was in Congress. But I think back to that. And um, as we move deeper and deeper and deeper into the world of communism uh, in Czechoslovakia, and then uh, into Poland, and then into what was then the Soviet Union, today Ukraine, it got more, you felt at each border as though these giant iron doors really were closing behind you. We were the only car. There were no gas stations, there were no 7-Elevens, uh, there were no paved streets. Um, so that's a whole long story, but I sort of say that to orient some of those who may have never driven that drive it's a different drive today, but that that world existed. And then to try to piece together remnants of history, I still try to do that today, and to actually see how the people there were living. I got very sick in Soviet-occupied Ukraine, and I uh, was able to get out with mom, and we eventually, I eventually recovered at the Gellert Hotel in Budapest. I have a very fond memory of that. And how important orange juice was, <laughs> because we couldn't get medicine, but you certainly couldn't get anything in Ukraine. 
And I go back now and I look at how far the world has come from 1973 until 2015. And all I can say to you is, the knowledge you have, the experience you have, what you are doing through your foundation is truly important to liberty and to the course of liberty across our globe. The, I, I thank you for your work. I thank you for your compassion in honoring the victims and those who have suffered. And finding a way to tell those stories. Every life is precious. And those lives that have suffered, people who have suffered, the people who have died, they deserve recognition. And you are dedicated to that purpose. Um, personally, um, I think of I, uh, your guests uh, from Cambodia um, and uh, those who have been recognized from Hungary and other countries. I think of some of my favorite movies for those of you who are movie buffs. Uh, I think Killing Fields was one of the greatest movies I ever saw. And the individual stories need to be told. I think Torn from the Flag, which is about the Hungarian Revolution, oh my goodness, what an incredible piece of filmmaking that is. And uh, I'm personally working on a film back home now uh, with the help of many others, telling the story of one, one survivor of Polish American heritage, a Pole who fought in the Polish cavalry, was in, uh, imprisoned at Auschwitz and then at Gross Rosen and Leitmeritz, two other prison camps, escaped in 1945, a great soldier. At the point, he took me at age 95 to the place where World War II began and honored me. I was allowed to walk with him and to experience through his memory what he had endured and where he had gone. That was one of the two greatest trips of my life. And I just feel so compelled to tell that story uh, because it is a story that was many decades in coming because it's very hard for those who were victimized many times to tell their story and so many have passed and did not pass on their story. So I choose to come here today because I think what you are doing is just so extraordinary. I see Congressman Ritter sitting there and I know how many years you have been devoting yourself to this. And um, I thank you, Don, I thank you very much for, for continuing. And um, uh, all of you, um, I'm involved with archival collections in Cleveland right now, the Ukrainian Museum and Archives in Cleveland. They have an incredible collection now, just starting out of having people tell their story and making this a part of their collections. And I'm realizing, oh my gosh, if they didn't do this, it wouldn't exist. And a lot of these stories are of individuals who found freedom here in the United States, but never told the other half of their story. And some of Liberty's greatest stories are the stories of a person who actually has led more than one life. And just the difficulty of doing that sometimes hasn't allowed time to tell the story. So your event today uh, pays homage to the many, many heroes who have come before us. And I know that you have honored uh, Guillermo Farinas Hernandez. Thank you so very much uh, for doing that. Um, I have great hope uh, for Cuba. I have great hope for the countries of Eastern and Central Europe. And we know that the Soviet sphere, your theme uh, this year, is still very much deserving of our attention. A, revis a revisionist Russian government, an aggressive one, the orchestrated aggression toward Ukraine at the hands of President Putin, and a Europe too dependent on Russian energy has made for rising global tensions. And we know the history of Russia. The Russian people, and I've traveled through Russia extensively, the Russian people deserve better than they have. A nation that is never known liberty. We have a long way to go. The um, president of Russia would uh, love to see a destabilized Ukraine, and I believe that he, is a, he will try to wait out 
um, the lack of attention by the free world, and we can't allow that to happen. Uh, he's waiting out the failure of the government in Kyiv. There's infiltration throughout that country, as I think all of you probably know, and many, many efforts that are both seen and unseen to destabilize. We simply have to meet that test. Uh, many of us here know that, um, unfortunately, this type of repressive regime, uh, we've seen its fingerprints before. And your organization helps to remember, to document, uh, but also to inform a new generation, as you've said, of what the world can really be like. The, uh, this morning, in the Appropriations Committee on which I serve, we had a bill called the Foreign Operations Bill come forward. And there's additional assistance in that bill for Central and Eastern Europe. The United States lost, I don't want to say we lost focus, but there were other issues in the world we were concerned about. And there's additional assistance there to try to give Eastern and Central Europe a little bit of a boost as she tries to deal with her energy dependence uh, on Russia, and also now uh, the media infiltration in native languages of adjoining countries. We have to meet that challenge. We have to help educate the next generation, and every single one of you, wherever you come from, and you know this, whether you belong to an academic institution, whether you're an employee of a library, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a business person, whatever you are, you can find a touch point somewhere and make a difference in the lives of individuals in places that are not free. There are ways to do that. There's no better door opener than friendship and family and allowing worlds that are shut out from us to meet us, whether it's through sports, through the arts. You're clever. You know ways to do this. And I am amazed myself. Some of the young people that I've mentored in my office or scholarships that our family has given to young people to attend an academy somewhere in that part of the world, 20 years later, they become leaders. They become leaders in their villages. They become members of their own military. They become teachers. It is, I, I don't know what I thought when we first started to do it, but I have been amazed at even people who live in very meager circumstances, what a little bit of help can mean and the bridges that it can build. Uh, in the bill that we passed this morning out of committee, uh, we know we have to implement something called the Ukraine Freedom Support Act, which we passed last December uh, for Ukraine, our immediate uh, focus. And um, we know we have to have more aid for internally displaced people in Ukraine specifically because of the necessity to hold that place together more technical assistance on behalf of judicial reform, more attention paid to marginalized people, especially women. Uh, in Ukraine, you might be surprised to learn with the value of the Grivna dropping, their currency and food prices going up, and because of well over a million people being displaced, that the people who are holding the country together, and I'm talking about food production, are village women, Village women, they're not famous people, they don't have degrees, but on any weekend you can see people leave from the big cities and go out to these little places in the country to get some extra food. And I wonder what's going to happen to Ukraine as we move into the summer, into the fall. I tried very hard this year to get seeds to village women. I failed uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and I just spoke with Victoria Newland over at the State Department this afternoon saying, we must do this. We must help these village women help hold their countries together in a place where half the men are alcoholics. And you look at who's holding the country together. Simple implements, shovels, gloves, better seeds, canning equipment, drying equipment for apples, simple things. These are not complicated. We are capable of delivering this. Companies like Procter & Gamble have already to, uh, offered to help us in some uh, products that they handle. But this is a very powerful country, and each of us can do something to help in that very tender region right now. Uh, 
the bill that we passed last December, the Ukraine Freedom Support Act, will allow also the legislation provides for defense of lethal weapons to our ally Ukraine so that those who strive for a more free, democratic, and European society can actually fight for it. And uh, thus far, the Obama administration has chosen not to deliver that type of equipment. But we are doing more with military exercises uh, with Europe and with units from our country on the western edge of Ukraine. Poland has just received uh, the first major sale from Raytheon Corporation of over 10 million, um, uh, several million dollars worth of military equipment, including Patriot missiles, the largest sale since the um, uh, Poland entered NATO of military equipment to Poland. So I think that we are seeing uh, with the help of Hungary, with the help of Poland, uh, we are seeing a new security architecture in that part of the world. I don't know if there's anyone here from Lithuania uh, representing the Lithuanian embassy, but I'll tell you uh, that is one power pack of a country. And with the flyovers we've been doing with F-16s, with the kind of courage we're seeing in adjoining nations, I think there's a new, there's a new reality that's setting in in that part of Europe, and America wants to stand with you. And um, so I just, um, in closing, let me say, recalling the legacy of communism and uh, fulfilling your mission to memorialize the victims, to educate our public, and to document the evidence is, is important now as it has ever been. And I'm so happy you're here at the Library of Congress because I'll tell you about another failure of mine. <clears throat> Many years ago, I went to see the top librarian at the Library of Congress. I said, listen, I'm going all around the country and I'm finding these places I didn't know exist. I was in Chicago and I found, you know, the Polish American Museum uh, in center uh, uh, Chicago. Then I was in Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I found a Slovak museum, Czechoslovak museum. Then I was in Cleveland and I found this Ukrainian museum and archives and I said, are you connected to the Library of Congress? You got all these collections and so forth? And, no, no, we're just, you know, collecting. There are these institutions in Minnesota. They're all over our country. And I said, I got an idea. Why don't we get you connected to the Library of Congress? They're great at archival collections. And uh, I suggested this idea that I came here. And evidently, the library here has some kind of program where they charge these little libraries and collections $10,000 each for an associate membership. I can tell you. Many of the libraries and archives I went to cannot afford that annually. So I'm just sharing with you because you have the right attitude and interest that these institutions exist across our country. Their collections are precious. I was up in a town in Michigan, um, uh, Black Lake, near Black Lake, which has a large number of Polish American documents, Polish and Polish American documents, because there's a huge Polish population that settled in Michigan. And I went through this one room, and I saw these collections, and I said, well, they're not humidity controlled. They're not, you know, what's going to happen to them? And I guess I see part of the unfinished work of America is not to lose these collections. So I just, I'm sure you know these exist. I don't even have an exhaustive list of them, but I feel bad because some of the stories you are trying to tell are there. They're in those places where wonderful Americans understood how important this was. And they set aside a place and space never to forget. Let's hope we can figure out a better way of connecting and making sure that we don't lose these precious stories and the story it tells us about human progress. So I just want to thank you so very much today. I hope I've covered some topics that you're interested in. You are more than welcome to our office. Anything I can do to help, please let me know. I'm just so very proud of you and the work that you are doing. Thank you so very much for the opportunity today.